Good morning. I'm Reverend Alice Anacheka Naisman, Minister of the Unitarian Church of Marlboro and Hudson. Welcome to this last of four shared worship services together with the Unitarian Church of Marlboro and Hudson and First Parish Unitarian Universalist of Northboro. I have to say, if nothing else, it was a joy and worth doing this just to have Olga and Robin playing together like that. That's absolutely fantastic and amazing. I also wish to welcome warmly our friends and neighbors from the Unitarian Universalist Society of Grafton and Upton, some of whom may be here with us on Zoom, others of whom will be joining us live stream. We are delighted that you're with us this morning. As we gather together as three congregations, we invite you into the mode of experimentation and curiosity as we experience one another's rituals and alternate between ways of doing things. We also invite you to add the name or initials of your congregation to your Zoom name so we all know who is joining us from where. Good morning. I'm the Reverend Linda Sutherland, Minister at First Parish Unitarian Universalist of Northboro. I'm inviting everyone to stay in gallery view for a few moments as we do a special online greeting that we've come to call the Brady Bunch greeting. So here's how it works. Wave into the camera, wave to the row above you and below you on either side. Good morning, everyone. To keep communication clear in this online format, we have some nonverbal signals for one another. We have a virtual hug for sending love and compassion. We have our huzzah, amen, hooray, fantastic, I love it. Uh, please do not wave just one hand or we might call on you. Uh, if for any reason during the service you need us to call on you, a single hand up. And then this is our hand knock of agreement and identification. It's a way of saying, yes, that's exactly what matches what's in my heart. And for security, we do invite you to use your real name on the screen so we know who is gathered with us. And now we'll get ready to light our chalices. Alice at the Marlboro Hudson Church and Celia at Northboro. If she is still here. There we are. Come you accidental pilgrims, you who find yourself on a journey of surprise and wonder. Come, you who emerge into this place as an act of liberation. Come, you who seek a life of mindfulness and a place to test your thoughts. Come, you who bring hearts of all kinds, heavy hearts, rusty hearts, hearts broken open in revelation, hearts full of love to share, Come you who seek courage and you who have more courage than you realize. Come you who stand behind the curtain gathering up the resources to claim your truth. Come you who have been in a bubble, you who have are poised for transformation. We begin our story again, gathering courage, love, mindfulness, and a sense of purpose. We gather as people of all ages, of different abilities, different backgrounds, and different perspectives. We share a covenant, a direction for our shared journey, and a commitment to encourage and challenge one another to spiritual growth. This path will ask much from us. Let us move forward with love. Let us move forward with appreciation for one another. Let us move forward knowing we are not alone. Whoever you are, whatever your gifts, you are welcome to join this journey. Please join in this unison affirmation, which we say every week together at the Unitarian Church of Marlboro and Hudson. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. 
This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony with the divine. And now I invite you to take a deep breath. Feel yourself grounded on this good earth and let yourself be drawn into worship this morning with this threshold moment. We gather as around a campfire, listening to the stories of the people seeking and searching. In the world of the driven, let us be drawn in. Let your love be a given, let us be drawn in. To imagine to dream, to create, to redeem. For the sake of the living, let us be drawn in. Here is where I found my voice and chose to be brave. Here's where I was once forgiven, was ready for once in my life to receive forgiveness and to be transformed. And I survived that also. I lived to tell the tale. Here's a time, and here's another, when I laid down my fear and walked right on into it, right up to my neck into that roiling water. Here's a place, a murky puddle, where I have stumbled more than once and fallen. I don't know yet what to learn there. Here's where I was told that something was wrong with my eyes, that I see the world strangely. And here's where I said, yes, I know. I walk in beauty. In the world of the driven, let us be called in. Let your love be a given, let us be drawn in. To imagine, to dream, to create, to redeem. For the sake of the living, let us be drawn in. Here is where I began to look with my own eyes and listen with my ears and sing my own song, shaky as it is. Let us open our eyes, listen with our ears and sing our own songs. Come, let us be drawn in. Good morning. I'm Cynthia Menard, the Director of Lifelong Learning for the Unitarian Church of Marlboro and Hudson. Our story for all ages this morning is a different kind of superhero, Christopher Reeve. It was a hot, muggy morning. Christopher was not sure he really wanted to be out riding in a competition. His thoroughbred horse, Eastern Express, seemed a bit off as if maybe he would rather be grazing in the field than doing the demanding work of running and jumping with a big muscular man on his back. Maybe, Christopher thought, it would be nicer to take the kids sailing today where there would be a cool breeze. Well, he thought, I am a lucky man to be able to choose between riding and sailing. In fact, plenty of people watching Christopher that day thought the same thing. He was many people's idea of a superhero. He was the actor who played Superman in movies and in real life, he fit the part. Handsome, strong, always striving towards a goal, chasing his best time or learning a new skill. And then in an instant, everything changed. Eastern Express balked at a jump, sending Christopher crashing to the ground. 
When he woke up in the hospital, Christopher couldn't move his hands or feet. He couldn't even breathe without the help of a machine. Although doctors could repair his neck, they could not fix the injury to his spinal cord. And now Christopher's brain was unable to communicate with most of his body. Even though he still had all his strength, intelligence, and willpower, there was simply no way for him to move any part of his body below his head. Despair washed over Christopher. If he could not do anything, could not be useful to anyone, why not put him out of his misery like they did with horses that were too injured, that were bat too injured to walk again? Maybe, he said to his wife, Dana, we should just let me go. But Dana spoke words that helped him start out on the road towards his new life. She said, but you're still you and I love you. Of course, Christopher Reeve had never actually been able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, but he had been a tremendous athlete. He had always liked a goal, a challenge, something to work for. Before his accident, Christopher's challenges involved acting, directing, and sports. Now his challenges were different. Now it took all his strength and determination to sit up in a wheelchair and steer it by puffing on a straw. His heart ached with all he had lost. He might never again be able to hug his wife and sons or ride a horse or sail. But he realized he still had a lot, the love of his family and money and fame from his career. And Christopher decided to use everything he still had to work for a new goal. As always, Christopher Reeve dreamed big. He hoped there might be a cure for spinal cord injuries, not just for himself, but also for many thousands of others whose lives had been changed when their backs or necks were broken. He and his wife set up the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. They asked people for money to help pay scientists to research a cure. And then Dana realized how lucky they were to be able to afford a ramp into their home and a big van that could fit Christopher's wheelchair. They collected money to help pay for ramps and other helpful things so more people with spinal cord injuries could have them as well. Christopher realized that even though he could no longer use his arms and legs, he had a power that many people do not. He was famous. People thought of him as Superman. Now he really could be a hero, not by flying through the air to rescue people, but by speaking up. Because he was famous, people would pay attention, they would listen, and they would want to help. It wasn't easy. Christopher didn't want people to feel sorry for him, and he didn't want to be embarrassed if he couldn't use his mouth to speak well, or if his body, as sometimes happened, jerked around without his control. But he knew this was a special chance to use the power he had to make the world a better place. So Christopher started speaking. He asked Congress to support stem cell research that might lead to a cure for spinal cord injuries. He asked groups of people to get involved and donate money. He talked with others who had experienced injuries like his. He even spoke on television to millions of people during the Academy Awards, showing everyone that although his abilities had changed, his heart and soul were strong and capable. A writer for Reader's Digest magazine interviewed Christopher Reeve near the end of his life in 2004 and asked him why he had joined a Unitarian church. He answered, it gave me a moral compass. I often refer to Abe Lincoln who said, when I do good, I feel good. And when I do bad, I feel bad. And that is my religion. I think we all have a little voice inside us that will guide us. It may be God, I don't know, but I think that if we shut out all the noise and clutter from our lives and listen, and if we listen close to that voice, it will tell us the right thing to do. Christopher Reeve showed us what a real life hero is, a person who listens to the voice inside them and acts when that voice tells them the right thing to do. I wonder, if you have ever been waylaid or felt betrayed by your body. I wonder if you've ever realized that you have a special ability or gift that you've used to help others. I wonder if you've ever been a hero without realizing the impact you've had on others.
And we now drop one final stone. We already did that. <laughs> Let us join our hearts together. Now, in a time of prayer and meditation, we'll begin with a meditation in song, followed by a meditation in words, and then in silence. And the song is the one that we recorded, the joint choirs recorded yesterday, and I was there. of life and love, holy one of our being and our becoming, that which is sacred within, among, and beyond us. We know so many stories about you. God, Lord, King, Father, Earth Mother, Great Spirit, Universe, Holy Parent, Divine Love, Deepest Longings, Covenanted Partner. We know stories about our country and its founding, too, of the values we claim as a people. We have stories about those narratives, about how our values have and have not manifested in our reality. Blessed One, we also know so many stories about ourselves, some of them the same stories we tell about others. Beautiful, ugly, simple, difficult, joyous, useful, worthless. Stories about who we are, what we know, and the potentials and impossibilities of our future. Stories about our purpose and the meaning of our lives. We have countless stories buried too deep in our souls 
for us to even recognize them. God of discovery, help us find the strength to excavate those buried stories. Let us lean on one another as we brush them off, hold them up to the light, and find their meaning and use. May our roots nourish us so that we might grow abundantly and flower into blessings for one another and the world. And above all, Holy Parent, sing us a gentle lullaby in the trees and the wind, in the kind words of our neighbors, in the warmth of the sun and the sparkle of the snow. Whisper to us the truest story you know and sing it to us in notes we can never unhear. Remind us every day, every moment, that we are beloved, 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 as we hold a time of silence. Amen. Blessed be. May it be so.
In the quiet, peaceful Shire, a young hobbit is surprised to be gifted with a ring, a terrible, powerful, magical ring. Frodo finds his happy-go-lucky days of eating second breakfasts and elevenses rudely interrupted, and he is propelled, propelled forward on a dangerous quest. A slave owner in Georgia dies, leaving his plantation and all of his slaves to his brother, an even crueler master than he. The young slave woman, Cora, is invited to escape. Her story unfolds in the new Amazon Prime series, The Underground Railroad. A young neglected orphan boy with a strange lightning bolt scar on his forehead lives in the tiny closet underneath the stairs in the home of his aunt and uncle. Harry is bullied mercilessly by his cousin, constantly demeaned and belittled by his aunt and uncle. His adventure begins on his 11th birthday when strange magical things start to happen. A tornado rips a house off of the ground along with the young girl inside of it. When everything settles, Dorothy discovers she is in a strange magical land with only one desire, to get home to Kansas. In 1949, Joseph Campbell, professor of mythology and religion, published his favorite book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. In it, he discusses what he called the monomyth, the one central story that shows up in countless variations and forms throughout history across different cultures. He outlined 17 distinct stages in what he called the hero's journey the archetypal story of a man or a woman who sets off on an adventure, meets with difficult challenges and tests, and ultimately is rewarded and transformed. Author and screenwriter Christopher Vogler consolidated the 17 steps into 12 stages that are often divided into three distinct phases in a story, the departure, the initiation, and the return. Campbell's work has been criticized over the years. Some critics point out that he simply ignored the stories and myths that didn't fit into his thesis of the monomyth. And while it may well be true that not all stories fit conveniently into the same mold, it is also true that there is something clearly compelling for us in the hero's journey motif. It shows up in fairy tales. Cinderella longs to go to the ball. Jack trades his cow for a handful of beans. It shows up in our epic sagas, the Odyssey, Narnia, the Hobbit. It shows up in our movies, Star Wars, The Matrix, Spider-Man. And it shows up in our great religious stories. Moses is told by a burning bush to go free the Israelites from Egypt. The sheltered prince Siddhartha Gautama goes for a walk and he sees death and illness and suffering for the first time. Muhammad meditates in a cave and an angel orders him to recite the words before him. Unable to read or to write, Muhammad nonetheless is able to recite the words that have been revealed to him, which ultimately become the Quran. The hero's journey starts in the ordinary world, stage one. The hero is usually blissfully unaware of whatever is about to befall them. The heroes are ordinary people of all ages, genders, races, ethnicities. Often they hold as of yet undiscovered powers. Or there is a deep secret, a mystery. There is something about their identity they don't yet know. Stage two is the call to adventure. Something happens, a tornado, an illness or death. Owls start appearing with letters. A gift is received. A wardrobe turns out to lead into a magical land. Stage three is the refusal to answer the call to adventure. Moses argues with God, I don't have the right skills for this. They won't listen to me. Don't you mean somebody else? A slave named Caesar encourages Cora to try to escape with him, and at first she refuses to go. This leads to stage four, 
meeting with the mentor. Gandalf arrives to guide Frodo on his journey. Hagrid arrives to take Harry to Hogwarts. Finally, the hero accepts the quest and moves on to stage five, crossing the threshold. Siddhartha Gautama leaves his home in a palace to explore the origins of suffering and ultimately become the Buddha. Cora and Caesar run away from the plantation. Frodo leaves the comfort of the Shire. After the threshold, we move into the initiation phase of the hero's journey. The hero's encounters tests, allies, and enemies, stage six. The hero approaches the inmost cave, stage seven, experiences terrible ordeals, take stage eight, and ultimately is rewarded for their efforts, stage nine. There are basilisks, cyclopes, shipwrecks, travels through the wasteland, temptations, mazes with minotaurs, impossible riddles to answer, apples that make you fall asleep, wicked witches, evils so terrible they must not be named. The journey is difficult. Our heroes run out of food and water. They are pursued. They lose their horses and travel by foot. They are abandoned by their comrades. But also there are helpers, fairy godmothers who turn pumpkins into coaches, abolitionists on the Underground Railroad, talking beavers who provide shelter, scarecrows and tin woodsmen. Finally, our heroes are victorious. They are rewarded with marriage to the prince, riches beyond belief. They find their long lost parent. They defeat the evil wizard. They gain the cure to the illness and they begin the next phase of the hero's journey, the return, which begins with the road back, includes a resurrection, one final test or a miraculous transformation. And finally, stage 12, they return with the elixir, the elixir of life. The golden goose keeps their mother comfortable for the rest of her life. The sick king is saved. Odysseus is reunited with Penelope. It is a compelling story arc that holds our attention over and over again in movies, in books, in real life history. It is in part compelling because the hero is so surprised to find themselves in the midst of their adventure. The hero is ordinary, or so we think. The hero is out of their depth, unequal to the challenge, or so we think. The hero can be anyone, a lonely, neglected orphan, an illiterate slave, a baby that was abandoned in a basket and rescued from the river. The hero can be you, or maybe even me.
even though I can't fly, I can do my little part here before I he die, yeah. I may not win the Nobel Prize, but at least I can try to be a little more kind, spend a little more time in my chain room life, yeah. Like giving a hug when somebody is down have no way to get away from telling a story. It's how our brains make meaning. Brain scientists tell us that waking or sleeping, our brains tell us stories all the time. Jonathan Goschel, in his book, The Storytelling Animal, argues that storytelling has evolved like other behaviors to ensure our survival. Until the day we die, we are living the stories, story of our lives. And unlike a novel in process, our life stories are always changing and evolving, being edited, rewritten, and embellished. Carolyn Gregoire, in her article, What Your Life Story Really Says About You, says stories may not seem like a basic survival need, but our brains naturally tell stories as a way to give structure and meaning to our lives. And according to research in narrative psychology, an emerging field of study that examines how stories shape our lives and personalities, the stories we tell ourselves play a large role in who we are. Fairy tales are true not because dragons are real, but because they assure us that dragons can be vanquished. Storytelling then fictional or non-fictional, realistic or embellished with dragons is a way of making sense of the world around us. 
Her article reports on a study that examined the life stories of a group of people in their 30s and 40s who were seen by themselves and others as being highly generative, meaning caring, productive, and committed to making a positive difference in the world. And they found again and again that these people brought themes of redemption into their narratives. Redemption is seen as when something in the story starts really bad and people will talk about a negative event, a failure, some kind of disruption or loss, and then they'll transition into some positive outcome from that. That's redemption. For example, a generative person might view getting fired or divorced as a catalyst for a better opportunity to arise later down the road, perhaps to teach them some things as well. The basic art of a generative script is always one of going through suffering and then coming out of it better than you were before. We all know how to do that, and many of us do it, says the article, but the highly generative people do it a lot. They have about twice as many of those themes in their life stories as do the rest of us. At the level of conscious awareness, there are things that we can do to make our stories better. Try to accentuate the positive. When you're in the midst of turmoil and chaos, it's hard to step back and say, hmm, maybe I'm going somewhere with this that's positive. And yet, although we may not see in what ways positive may arise out of it, there is usually something that we can do. Perhaps even survival can be seen as a regenerative story. This does not deny reality but it recognizes the personal power to respond to life events in either destructive or in life-giving ways. The song we just heard is a classic example of redemption story. It goes from the world is full of bad stuff and I feel small and powerless. And so I need a hero to swoop in and set everything right and moves toward a more mature understanding of the world is full of bad stuff, but I helped somebody's life be better. So to them, today, I'm a hero. A life story is written in chalk, not ink, and it can be changed, says Julie Beck in her Atlantic article, Story of My Life, How Narrative Creates Personality. You're both the narrative and the main character of your story. That can sometimes be a revelation. Oh, I'm not just living out this story. I'm actually in charge of this story. We gain control over the story of our life by recognizing and embracing the struggles of our own hero's journeys. Brene Brown in her book, Rising Strong, says you may not have signed up for the hero's journey. But the second you fell down or got your butt kicked or suffered disappointment, screwed up or felt your heart break, it started. Choosing to write our own story means getting uncomfortable. It's choosing courage over comfort. And that's when we realize we're in the woods again. We hesitate. Like the baker in the Sondheim classic, Into the Woods, we ask, can't we just live out our lives with our children and our wives? But the answer is no. It's into the woods, into the woods, into the woods, where danger and pain await, but also magic and treasures, experience and wisdom. This is the point at which we accept the quest and decide to start out, leaving the comforts of familiar thought patterns and accepting the possibility of a redeeming narrative that we may not yet be able to glimpse. Hmm, maybe I'm not seeing the whole picture. 
when we gain the courage to seek the depths, we come to the uncanny discovery that the seeker is the mystery which the seeker seeks to know. As a seeker hero, we can see this truth about ourselves. We can be always curious, always learning, always wrestling with deep and exalted issues. And we are always, always of worth, not after we reach the final stage, but every step along the journey. Brene Brown reminds us, you are worthy now, not if, not when. We are worthy of love and belonging now, right this minute, as is. And at the same time, as worthy and beloved human beings, we're also always learning, always growing, always moving on to the next chapter where another journey awaits. We can ask curious questions which open the door to discovery. The singer in the superhero song we just heard asks, is it our time now to bring the good back in? Which leads to the realization, there's a lot of good we can do right here, right now. As we each walk into our future, our map of the journey in progress will no doubt mark moments like the ones Victoria Safford mentioned in the reading we used in our threshold moment. Moments where we found our voice and chose to be brave. Moments when we laid down our fear and walked right into it. Moments when we began to look with our own eyes. Moments when cruelty taught us something. Moments when we were astonished by gratuitous compassion and knew it was a miracle of healing. Moments where something caught us, a warm breeze in late winter, bird song in late summer. May we leave space for redemption in our personal and collective stories especially as we begin to tell the story of what we may become. Using the compass of our UU faith and principles to create a map for life of integrity, a life in service of a greater good, a life that is whole and holy. May we accept and embrace the true story that we are all heroes, that we are each a work in progress and that we are each of us at the same time, both worthy and whole, just as we are. Blessed be, amen. May it be so. Half of our offering today will go to Together on Turtle Island a new 501c3 group that started up last March in response to COVID to bring relief to Native peoples. UCMH has been donating masks and giving financial support since last year. Their mission statement is, Together on Turtle Island is a unique intertribal organization, Native-founded and Native-led. We are dedicated to respecting and honoring the voices and innate abilities of all Native people through partnership, collaboration, and intertribal coordination. Utilizing both short and long-term programs, Together on Turtle Island seeks to foster and support sovereignty in the areas of water, food, PPE, and other necessities of daily life. Please give as generously as you are able to support this life-sustaining cause using the instructions provided in chat.
Now, as we get ready to sing our closing hymn today, I want to mention how much fun it has been creating these services with two teams together. And we're going to try something a little fun on our closing hymn as well. Some of you may know that when Jason Shelton was asked to consider the impact of only able-bodied narratives on our siblings who are differently abled. He graciously changed his lyrics from standing on the side of love to answering the call of love. Of course, the hymn book, our hymn book still says standing, and those are the words that we will put up on the screen today. But now is a perfect time since we're all singing at home for each of us to personalize the song a little bit. So whether you sing answering the call or rolling, limping, scooting, or even planted on the side of love or standing, we know that as we sing along, we are all figuratively at least going to be standing on the side of love.
And now, and now we prepare, we prepare to, to extinguish, extinguish our chalice. We have gathered in love, worshiped in hope, and lifted our hearts in peace. We go now to share these blessings with the world. I share with you these benediction words by the Reverend Shari Woodbury. May we have the courage to speak or write the stories within us that need to be told, the stories that make up our lives. May we listen with a loving mind and heart to the stories of others' lives, others here in these congregations and others in our wider community and world. Let us choose with care the stories that we teach to our children, remembering that all of our stories have power and that all of our stories are connected for all of life is one. In the name of all that is sacred in these gathered hearts, may it be so. Amen. Blessed be. May it ever be so. I believe we now have our postlude. Yep, sorry. It's just taking me a minute. I had a lot of videos. I understand. I'll take this moment to join my joy as well as Linda's in the four weeks of shared worship and also having had our friends from UUSGU here as well this morning. What a pleasure it has truly been. Thanks, Alice, for giving me that extra second. <laughs> I, I got it. Thank you. 